Hello and good afternoon to everyone on the call. Thank you for joining us um, today for our leukemia Q&A. Today's program is focused on chronic leukemias. My name is Carrie Callis. I'm the Director of Programs at the Leukemia Research Foundation. I'd like to take an opportunity to thank our webinar partner, Patient Empowerment Network, and our program supporters, Abvi, Beijing, GlaxoSmithKline, and Merck. The Leukemia Research Foundation's mission is to cure leukemia by funding innovative research and to support patients and families. The foundation has raised over $83 million in support of its mission and has funded research grants to over 600 new investigators worldwide. Our free support programs for leukemia patients and their loved ones include information and resources, educational programs like this one, peer support services, financial assistance, and a directory of other helpful organizations and resources. We are, um, just to give you a little update, we're about to add some additional content onto our website for patients and caregivers in the coming week. So be sure to check that out at leukemiarf.org. Just a few quick housekeeping items for the program today. All participants will be muted throughout the program. If you already submitted a question for the program at registration, please know that we have them and we'll get to as many as we possibly can. You can also type a question into the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. So not the chat box, but there's a little box at the very bottom that says Q&A. You can type it in there. After today's program, you will be sent a brief evaluation mail. So please take just a moment to complete it because it greatly helps us with future programming. Also, this program is being recorded and will be sent to all registrants. We are incredibly um, grateful to have our expert panel here today, um, Dr. Dininger from Versity and the Medical College of Wisconsin, Dr. Kite from The Ohio State University, and Dr. Thurman from the University of Chicago. I would like to now introduce our moderator of today's program, Dr. Karen Carlson. Dr. Carlson is Assistant Professor of Medicine at the Medical College of Wisconsin Division of Hematology and Oncology, specializing in acute and chronic myeloid leukemia, adolescent and young adult leukemia, myelodysplastic syndromes, and myeloproliferative disorders. Dr. Carlson's basic and clinical research focuses on bone marrow microenvironment and its impact on normal and leukemic blood cell production. I will now turn it over to you, Dr. Carlson. Oh, thank you so much, Carrie. Um, I'm so grateful to be able to moderate this session. And just briefly before we start, I was hoping each of our panelists could briefly introduce themselves as well. Um, Dr. Thierman, would you be able to give us just a few, few bits of information about yourself and your expertise? Yes, so I'm Michael Thurman. I'm at the University of Chicago. Uh, I have a lab here that studies uh, uh, leukemia and in particular fusion genes in leukemia. And in the clinic, I take care of uh, patients with uh, CLL, CML, AML, MDS, and other blood cancers. I've been fortunate to be involved with the Leukemia Research Foundation for a long time. I received a Young Investigator Award from them at the start of my career and served as the chair of the Medical Advisory Board for a few years. So very grateful to the LRF for the work that they do. Thank you. Dr. Kate, could you introduce yourself? Hey, I'm Adam Kate. I'm an assistant professor at The Ohio State University. I'm a clinical investigator and I specifically study chronic lymphocytic leukemia and Richter's transformation. Um, my clinic is all CLL all the time, so I uh, like CLL a lot, and uh, I'm happy to be here to answer any questions you guys have. Awesome, thanks. And Dr. Deininger, would you be able to introduce yourself briefly? So I'm Mike Deininger. I'm the director of the University Blood Research Institute in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, and a professor of medicine at the Medical College of Wisconsin. I have a long-standing interest in chronic myeloid leukemia and myeloid disorders. I'm running a lab and I've been involved in clinical trials of 
CML and other product models, neoplasms. And I look forward to your questions. And thank you for having me. Wonderful. Well, thanks for thanks for introducing yourselves, and we'll go ahead and get started. So, I, Terry, and I tried to kind of pull the questions together to make sure they were all we could talk about some consistent themes. And the first theme that came up were questions about treatment, and there were several questions specifically about CLL and the role of watching and waiting for people who have stage zero CLL. Um, I guess specifically, how long can this watch and wait period last? Is it a 10 years hard and fast, or is there some gradation there? Uh, Dr. Kate. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so how I counsel my patients is that it can be many, many years from the time of diagnosis until we need to start treatment. And many of my patients describe this as not watch and wait, but watch and worry, because they're just sitting around and worrying about their disease when we're not doing much about it. And the reason why we don't treat early is that there was um, historical data using chemoimmunotherapy that showed that we, if we treated earlier without waiting for the indications to treat that we use for CLL, that patients didn't live any longer and actually they lived less long uh, because they had all the side effects from the chemotherapy. That paradigm is now being um, re-examined in a couple of different clinical trials with our new drugs. And so we're excited to see where that goes. Um, but how I usually tell my patients is that there was a recent study that looked at um, three prognostic factors that could help predict when time to first treatment is. Um, one of those is if I can feel lymphadenopathy, um, whether they have the IGHV unmutated status, um, or if their lymphocyte count was greater than 15. If you have none of those factors, um, the study showed that patients could be in watch and wait for five plus years. If you have one of those factors, it's still uh, around five plus years. Two is three plus years, and all three is two plus years. Um, and these are all averages, but it helps give my patients a good idea of like what to expect. Um, and then there was a recent study that was published by the European group that looked at thousands of patients um, in watch and wait. And what they found was that if uh, you lacked a TP53 mutation um, and also you had IGHV mutated status, that the median time to first treatment was 10 years. Um, actually 10 plus years. So I look at all those different things um, and we discuss it with our patients and let them know sort of what to expect. And it's totally a time when a lot of patients do worry more about their disease where we're just kind of watching the numbers rise without treating it. Um, another um, individual wrote in asking whether CLL can turn into a different type of lymphoma, even if it's during the watch and wait period. And I guess an additional question, if that were to happen, what, what would that look like? I'll go ahead and keep talking. Yeah, um, thanks, Dr. So when CLL transforms into an aggressive lymphoma, that's called Richter's transformation, and that's probably what they're referring to. Um, it happens in anywhere from 1% to 10% of patients, um, and typically it happens when patients are actively progressing and they start new treatment. So it can happen during the watch and wait phase, um, but it's not so typical. Usually we see it when patients start a treatment. And the reason why we see it then is because they probably had that Richter's transformation occur, and that's why they started to not feel well and why they met indications to treat. And so typically I, I see that transformation occur um, when treatment is initiated. Um, and uh, Richter's transformation is an area of unmet need in the world of CLL. Um, and there are new studies that are coming out that look, that look really promising for Richter's transformation. But overall, um, Richter's transformation is one of those events that I would advise um, someone to get a second opinion at an academic center if they're not already being seen at an academic center because it is a, um, a very difficult disease to treat. Um, I think I hit all the questions, but I think there might've been I one more. I think so, questions. thank you. That was perfect. Um, Dr. Dr. Thierman, I'll throw this one your way. If someone is in watch and wait for their CLL, are there precautions that you would advise for someone who was going to take a, take a trip overseas? Well, or anywhere? Yes, that's a good question. So usually there are very few precautions for people who are in watch and wait. I do think that people with CLL are at higher risk of infections. So I would counsel, uh, you know, certainly when, 
on an airplane or uh, going out uh, that it would be advisable to wear a mask as much as possible. Uh, I think it's important to make sure that uh, you're up to date on your COVID shots and the booster. Uh, but other than that, I think, you know, most people in watch and wait, uh, you know, are able to do most things without restrictions. Wonderful. Um, I may take a lead from your um, mention of being up to date on vaccinations and segue a little bit to COVID and chronic leukemias. Um, and I guess I'll, I'll send this back to Dr. Thierman again. What, what do you recommend in terms of booster vaccinations, especially, or anyone who's come, who would like to answer, especially, do you recommend a second bivalent COVID vaccine? Well, that's a good question. Uh, I recommend that everyone receive the first bivalent booster. Uh, and it looks like uh, the recommendation is going to be yearly in terms of getting a second bivalent uh, booster shot. That's still a little bit in flux. Uh, I also would say that uh, for uh, people with, with CLL, that if they do test positive for COVID in general, uh, I recommend that they uh, take Paxlovid, uh, except if they're on medications that have uh, uh, drug reactions. So that's something that you need to check with your provider. Uh, sometimes a drug can be held for a few days, other times not. But uh, in general, uh, we try to you know, make sure that everybody uh, with CLL gets, gets treated uh, and also, of course, vaccinated. Do you worry that the vaccine could make the leukemia worsen or relapse? Not at all. I don't think there's any reason to think that there's any risk at all from the COVID vaccine in terms of uh, relapse or progression. I think, you know, there are people out there who've tried to scare uh, people about the COVID vaccine, and I think that's very uh, unfortunate. One thing to remember is that if you have CLL and you get the vaccine, it is normal to develop lymph nodes on the side that the patient got the vaccine, which can be very scary for our CLL patients because they'll think that their disease is progressing. Um, but it will go down. Um, the lymph nodes do typically go down after the vaccine. There is no concern that it'll make the lymphoma or the CLL get worse. Um, and the other point there too is that whenever one of our CLL patients get an infection, they have more white blood cells than a normal person. So we do typically see the white blood cell count go up and then come back down after an infection or even potentially a vaccination. Um, and that's just because you just have more white blood cells in your system. So that's why you react that way. So if you do get the vaccine and your lymph nodes do increase on the side of the vaccine, they should get better, but certainly consult with your doctor as well. Awesome, thank you. Um, I'm going to pivot a little bit now to some very specific treatment questions, and I'm going to start with a question for Dr. Deininger. Um, someone astutely wrote in asking whether Asiminib will be a frontline therapy for CML anytime soon. What are your thoughts about this? The question is, anytime soon, I would say probably not. If the question is, at some point in the future, then I would think absolutely yes. Uh, so there are studies ongoing as we speak. I think it's safe to assume that these studies will show that it's a uh, highly efficacious and well-tolerated agent, but these trials just have to run their course until the company can make uh, an application for approval. So how far that's out, always hard to tell, a couple of years, two to three years perhaps. Got it, thank you. Um. In terms of CML, are there other new therapies that patients should be aware of? There are uh, several other new PKIs, tyrosine inhibitors, um, that are seeking regulatory approval. I do not personally think that they will really change the game here because they are more new to drugs that will not really uh, um, add to the armamentarium. Um, we'll, we'll have to see where, where it goes. Some of the data are still immature, so maybe there's a, a positive surprise here and there. But we'll, we'll, we'll have to see. So I don't think anything fundamentally 
different is is on the way at this point. All right, thank you. Um, a similar question for um, Dr. Kate. Um, are there new therapies coming down the line soon for CLL? Yeah, I think one of the most promising therapies that we're all excited about is a drug called pirtobertinib. So um, right now, one of the main drug classes that we use to treat CLL are something called the BTK inhibitors, and that's ibrutinib, acalabrutinib, and the recently approved xanabrutinib. And uh, we consider ibrutinib the first um, uh, uh, first iteration of the BTK inhibitors, and then acalabrutinib and xanabrutinib as a second generation BTK inhibitors. Acal and xanabrutinib are both safer than ibrutinib. Um, and now we have a new drug that just got approved for mantle cell lymphoma called pirtobrunib, which also targets that same protein, the BTK uh, protein. And um, it works in a way that it binds slightly different than the first and second generation BTK inhibitors. So it was developed specifically for patients who um, are refractory to those first and second generation BTK inhibitors. And uh, the reason why I say I'm excited about this drug is not only um, will it work for patients who have progression on one of those first or second generation BTK inhibitors, it also looked like it was remarkably safe in a very large trial. And so I think that drug specifically will allow us to um, treat patients with BTK inhibitors for an even longer amount of time. And uh, given its safety profile, I think that's why I'm really excited about it. Oh, well, that makes sense. Um, I guess a question I'll throw towards Dr. Thurman. How does the presence of a TP53 or a deletion 17P impact your choice of treatment for CLL? Well, that's a good question. It used to be that that, that would help determine whether or not uh, someone would respond well to chemotherapy. Uh, with uh, the newer drugs that we have, the BTK inhibitors uh, that Dr. Kate was just talking about and Venetoclax, uh, that's less of an issue. Uh, in general, the TP53 or deletion 17P uh, mutations are uh, thought to confer a higher risk for progression, but the patients who have these mutations are still responding very, very well to the new therapies that we have in CLL. Oh, wonderful. Um, I guess for either of our three participants, um, we had an individual write in who had been undergoing treatment or has had a diagnosis of CLL for many years and back in the age of FCR and they've moved through several other therapies including ibrutinib and venetoclax. Um, I guess the question is kind of what are next? I, and I appreciate we're not gonna render treatment decisions for an individual but certainly thoughts for people who may be in a similar position um, kind of what what would be your armament, armament for next choices for them? I can take this one. So I think if someone has already relapsed after both a BTK inhibitor, as well as venetoplax, they certainly should get a second opinion at an academic center. So in terms of simply drugs that you can use, unfortunately, there's not much out there that really works in this scenario. Um, there are a couple of things that can be done, um, but most of them are off-label. So I, I have combined BTK inhibitors and venetoclax for these patients and recaptured responses. So combining ibrutinib, acalabrutinib, or xanabrutinib with the venetoclax um, seems to work. Um, ultimately, though, they likely need to be considered for a stem cell transplant at this point, which is an option. Um, but certainly there's a lot of clinical trials op options out there if they can get connected. Um, that drug that I just talked about, pirtobrutinib, is now approved for mantle cell lymphoma. So oftentimes when a drug is already approved for another indication, you can apply for off-label use, um, especially with the amount of data that supports pirtobrutinib with CLL. I can imagine that you could get it as off-label use in this scenario as well. Um, and then uh, there are other options for clinical trials and CAR T-cell therapy for patients who have progressed on both those agents. Um, and lastly, the, the last drug class that could potentially be used are something called the PI3 kinase inhibitors. Um, but recently, um, it's hard to access those drugs because there was a meeting at the FDA where they took most of them off the market. Um, but you still probably could get a drug called idelalacib if you wanted to. Um, but that drug also hasn't been very well tested in patients who have 
um, already received the primary therapies, the BTK inhibitors and the BCL2 inhibitors. So in summary, I think that patients who are progressing on both those drugs should definitely be seen at an academic center to consider a clinical trial. Um, and if uh, not, I would probably combine the two, but obviously these conversations need to occur with their local provider as well. And it sounds like an additional evaluation for any lymph node that may be changing in character is suggesting fundamental changes in the disease course as well might be useful. Again, at an academic center, like you suggested earlier. Yeah, so if somebody is progressing with lymphadenopathy alone, meaning their lymph nodes are getting bigger without a elevated white count, um, something I get concerned about is, did they transform to Richter's transformation like we talked about before? And that um, is treated much differently than CLL. And so if there's a concern that someone has Richter's transformation because they have big lymph nodes, they're having terrible symptoms, symptoms they definitely should be evaluated um, and get a biopsy to look to see if that has occurred or not. No, oh, thank you. Um, I, I guess I'll throw this out to all three of you. Um, in terms of side effects now for some, some of the CLL therapies or actually CLL therapies that may be used in other malignancies as well, um, is our low platelet counts, low neutrophil counts, anemia, is that something that can be expected either at the beginning or long-term with people treated with venetoclax? Dr. Thierman, would you like to take that one? Sure. Uh, we do see low blood counts, uh, uh, not uncommonly uh, with venetoclax. Uh, usually uh, the counts are not severely low, just mildly low. And that's something that, that, that people can usually uh, tolerate. Uh, sometimes if, uh, uh, you know, either the platelet count or the neutrophil count is, is very, very low, we can reduce the dose of venetoclax. It's also important to look and see if there are any other drugs that are affecting the metabolism of venetoclax. So sometimes some antifungals can affect uh, the dose that should be used. So that's important to keep in mind. So again, it depends on the individual situation and it's hard to know without seeing what someone's been treated with and what their blood counts are to make a specific recommendation. But that, those are the general ways I look at it. Oh, thank you very much. Um, and same thing, anyone who'd like to comment on this next question, um, is ibrutinib safe for people who are on anticoagulation? I know there's a lot of people who may be on blood thinners for a blood clot or even a very common condition called atrial fibrillation. Is this a safe combination? So we do not give BTK inhibitors with warfarin. So it's actually contraindicated to do. Um, so anything else but warfarin is okay. However, I do get worried as patients add on anticoagulates. So for instance, if someone has a heart attack and is on an antiplatelet plus uh, Plavix plus a DOAC or something like that, and a DOAC, I mean a direct oral anticoagulant in a Pixaban or Rivaroxaban, and they're also on a Brutinib or another BTK inhibitor, that's what starts to get me a little bit worried um, when they're on multiple different drugs that can lead to bleeding. That being said, I have done it. It's not a reason to stop it, especially if they're gonna be on these blood thinners for a time-limited situation. So it really depends on patient to patient, but I would say that surely no warfarin for sure mm -hmm. uh, with the BTK inhibitors, um, but if someone is just on a Pixaban or Rivaroxaban for their atrial fibrillation, I've done that a lot. If someone started to experience bleeding problems, say they had blood blisters start to crop up in their mouth or their skin or nosebleeds, would that be a signal to go back and speak to their doctor for some more advice? 100%. Awesome. Thank you. All right. I'm going to move next to another form of treatment being hematopoietic cell transplantation. Um, we had several questions, one of which was specific to CML. And, um, and I may throw this to Dr. Deininger. Is there a point after a allogeneic stem cell transplant or cell transplantation in which patients no longer need to be tracked or have blood work to monitor for their CML rec to relapse? Well, um, that's a really good question. Uh, I would answer, uh, it depends on in which state of disease the transplant was done when 
this was a very high risk situation, say transplant in or second chronic phase of plastic transformation, then I would think it's wise to monitor PCRA whole among long term just to pick up um, an early relapse, which actually has been described up to 80 years post-transplant. On the other hand, if a transplant was done in chronic phase, maybe failed one or two PKIs, then patients have been consistently negative by PCR, have found the final bit of dominance. Chronic graft was so steep and required but I think it's something we can follow that the risk will never be zero, but there is nothing without any risk that you do ever in life. So I would support that. Maybe after five, six years, I would I would think it could be done. Got it. But certainly it sounds like someone should anticipate maintaining regular blood work with their transplant center who can not just monitor their BCR able, but maybe monitor chimerism and things like that as well, um, especially during those early transplant years for CML. I'm not sure. I think yeah. if you have a successful allogeneic stem cell transplant, you are off immune, uh, off, uh, immunosuppression. If you have no signs of only graft resistance disease, you're just fine. I think at some point you can actually go back to your primary care provider and show up for an release. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, for any of the three of you, what are some good resources for learning about transplants, specifically if someone wanted to find out about success rate at a specific center and what to expect overall for life expectancy improvement after a stem cell transplant? Um, Dr. Thierman? Well, we, our transplant group uh, has put together a handbook that we give to patients when they come the first time. It has a, a sort of a, a list of all the questions that people have asked us over the years and, and the answers that we've put together in general, not for someone's specific mm -hmm. disease, but uh, for transplant in general, what to expect. And I think a lot of the transplant centers have that. I think uh, there is material online from the Leukemia Research Foundation and other societies uh, also about transplant. Probably the best thing is to go around to one or two transplant centers and meet with the team and see what information they can provide and what resources they have. And I'll, I'll, I'll add to that that bethematch.org is often a very good resource as well. Um, it's through the NM, National Marrow Donor Program or NMDP. And while they may not have information, as Dr. Thurman alluded to, specifically relevant to your, you know, an individual's particular disease and donor options, it's a great reference for transplant quality around the country. Um, Another question about transplant, what donor options are available for someone who may not have siblings or may not have a parent who is available to be a donor? Um, I can take that. I mean, yeah, awesome. in, 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 in principle, there's always the option of a matched unrelated donor. Um, it depends very much of what your uh, ethnic background is. Uh, what kind of probability there is that you will find a good or an acceptable match in one of the registries. Uh, so that's certainly the first place to go to. In the past, there has been a lot of interest in using donor uh, in, in using port blood as donor, uh, which can be given in, in almost any situation. Now that usage has been declining recently for sibling, which is what I either family or either sibling who's qualifying for other identity transplant. But there are still some centers that will do for blood transplants. So I think with that in mind, it's an option. I think practically everyone. Wonderful. So I, I, 
your your um, sound cut in and out, but just to briefly uh, synopsis, matched unrelated donors are options for people as well as umbilical cord transplants and also um, haploidentical transplants, depending on who's available from a family member. Awesome, thank you so much. Um, and then I think the final group of questions in our bucket of treatment options really circles around clinical trials. And I know we've alluded to that a few times. Um, we had people ask, how do they enroll in a clinical trial? Um, Dr. Kate, are you able to field that one? Yeah, sure. Um, so clinical trials are typically offered at academic centers or centers that are associated uh, with academic centers. Um, there are also some large groups out there that have the capability of doing uh, clinical trials, such as uh, a group called Sarah Cannon um, in the, uh, basically in Southern United States. So clinical trials are available in a lot of different places. And ultimately, um, what you should do is inquire with your treating physician about clinical trials, whether they have them available at wherever you're being seen. Um, and um, it's always a good question to ask, um, if you don't have any clinical trials, is this a situation where you think me looking for a clinical trial is worthwhile? And your local doc should be able to uh, give you an idea of whether or not they think that a clinical trial is a good idea for you. Um, typically, most academic centers will have the list of clinical trials somewhere on their website if you just kind of look and dig deep into it. Um, you can also look at clinicaltrials.gov. It's kind of a hard website to navigate, to be honest, but you can try inputting your disease type into the search bar and doing a search that way to try to find clinical trials across the country. And you can also sort them by uh, whether or not they're actively recruiting patients or not, and then try to reach out to whoever they have listed there as the uh, primary investigator for the clinical trial. But there's all sorts of clinical trials. I think start with um, your treating provider first to determine whether or not you are somebody that he, he or she thinks should be on a clinical trial. Um, and if uh, you want to see what clinical trials are out there, you can try clinicaltrials.gov. Um, but as I said, the website's a little bit wonky. Um, so I would try maybe your local academic center, whatever's closest to you to see if there's clinical trials in your disease type. Wonderful, thank you. Um, we had one very specific question asking about MR1 restricted MAIT cells as an off the shell allo CAR T cell option. And I guess I may phrase that for people who are involved or interested in CAR T as a therapy. What, what does the landscape look like for off the shelf CAR T products versus CAR T where it's made from a patient's own individual T cells? How, how far out is that? Um, I can do it. Awesome. Um, Thanks, Dr. Tijay. <laughs> so uh, right now there is uh, no approved off-the-shelf CAR T cells. So um, as Dr. Carlson had said, um, CAR T cells can either come from yourself or from someone else. Um, if they are from yourself, um, that's called an autologous CAR T cell product versus someone else is called an allogeneic CAR T cell product. Um, and that's the same thing for stem cell transplant, it's the same language. Um, and right now, the way that CAR T cells work is that they um, hook patients to a machine that takes out their white blood cells. Um, they then modify those white blood cells in the lab uh, to target the cancer, and then they reinfuse those CAR T cells um, back into the patient. Um, currently, um, CAR T cell approvals using that method are approved for diffuse large B-cell lymphoma, follicular lymphoma, um, as well as multiple myeloma, and also mantle cell lymphoma. Um, there are some studies uh, looking at one of those products called Lysacel or Lysocaptogene marilusal um, for CLL, and that hopefully will work, but we have to see what the clinical trial looks like in the randomized study. Um, and then in terms of, and then, and I should say that in general, um, what I'm seeing a lot of as opposed to off-the-shelf CAR T cells is actually increased manufacturing time. So one of the biggest problems with CAR T cells currently is that from the time of taking the white blood cells out and manufacturing them to target the cancer to putting them back into the patient, it takes around three to four weeks typically. Um, and what we're seeing now is there's a lot of new studies using those same kind of products that I just mentioned, but shortening that time, which is sort of the biggest deal currently with CAR T cells. Because if someone needs CAR T cells, 
waiting three or four weeks is kind of a long time before they get that therapy. Um, so right now I'm seeing a lot of shortening of that time with a lot of different products. So I expect actually that to come around maybe first before, before off the shelf CAR T cells. Um, but yes, there was some um, studies presented at our recent um, national convention called ASH, uh, looking at off the shelf CAR T cells um, as an option. And I'll end by saying, because I know I talked a lot about this, is that there's another group of drugs called bispecific antibodies that kind of work very similar to CAR T cells. And those are off the shelf uh, products. And what that does is uh, it's an antibody that brings the T cells over to the cancer. Um, so that's an off the shelf product currently um, that um, it will be approved soon for various different diseases. Wonderful, thank you. Um, we had a couple questions asked about what why do people get these cancers and what are the risk factors? So I might ask Dr. Deininger to first talk about risk factors for developing CML and Dr. Thurman, the same question about um, CLL. Uh, Dr. Deininger? So for, 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 for CML, uh, as far as genetic risk is concerned, it is running in the family. There really is no other so the Frequency of CML is thing around the world, a little more common in men than in women, but there is no genetic risk to speak about. Um, the only environmental exposure that, that we know is causing the agriculture is ionizing radiation. Ionizing radiation, that got it. No, the bomb, atomic bombs. Incidence of CML about eight years later, uh, but that's about it. Nothing else has been substantiated. Wonderful, thank you, Dr. Thurman. Is it hereditary versus environment versus yes for CLL? Well, it's a very complicated question and and difficult to sort out. So we yeah. know that there are some families that have a higher predisposition to develop CLL, and I've had several uh, patients with CLL who have uh, close relatives who also have CLL. We also see that, that there's a little bit uh, uh, of an increased frequency of other blood cancers like uh, multiple myeloma in people who have uh, uh, CLL. So I think there probably is a familial predisposition. We don't know what genes might be responsible for that. In terms of environmental exposures, it's been very hard to sort out. There have been some questions raised about pesticide exposures of various types uh, or herbicides and whether or not they might increase the risk of CLL. It's very, very tough to know that, but that, that's been uh, something that people have, have questioned. So, we have some data on hereditary factors and some data on environmental factors as well. Wonderful, thank you. Um, we had quite a few questions about monitoring remission and the question of minimal residual disease in CLL. Um, Dr. Kate, could you talk a little bit about what remission is in CLL and what role minimal residual disease plays in understanding that? Yeah. So for patients on long-term BTK inhibitor therapy, um, typically they get into what we call a partial response. Um, and some patients, about 5 to 10% will get into a complete remission or a complete response. Um, and for patients with venetoclax, and I'll talk about what I mean by partial response and complete response in a second. For patients on, for venetoclax um, who complete one year of therapy in the frontline setting or two years of therapy in the relapse setting, um, they typically get into a complete response um, and can also get into a place called undetectable minimal residual disease. So what are the differences between those? It's very confusing. So the response criteria are determined by our society called the International Workshop of CLL. And you, they are pretty stringent criteria for the how, how, how much the CLL you detect in your blood, um, as well as in your bone marrow. Um, it turns out, in general, that the deeper responses that people get 
the deep, the longer they tend to stay on therapy. So if you're on a BTK inhibitor um, and you get into complete response, typically you have longer time on therapy in that response than patients with a partial response. That being said, I have a lot of patients who've sat at a partial response for years and done just fine. Um, in venetoclax, um, the story is a little bit different. Um, so it appears that the deeper that you can get into what they call undetectable minimal residual disease, and I'll talk about a second about what I mean by deeper, um, also seems to relate to how long patients have till they progress. So the better response that patients have, they typically have a longer time till they progress. Um, so what is undetectable minimal residual disease? So it's sort of, I feel like, I feel like I think about this in terms of um, how much CLL can I detect, right? So partial response, you can detect some CLL in the blood or bone marrow. Complete response, um, you can't detect any CLL um, in the blood or the bone marrow using standard testing, something called flow cytometry. Undetectable minimal residual disease um, is you can't detect any CLL in the blood or the bone marrow or using standard testing or advanced testing called um, clonoseq is typically the test that we're using is approved for uh, FDA. Um, and that's um, a special type of testing that looks at the smallest amount of CLL in your bone marrow. And so that's the difference between all those things. In general, the more, the less that you can detect the CLL, the better, the longer time that patients have till progression. Um, in general, um, I don't really use the MRD testing all that much to make treatment decisions. Um, a situation where I would consider using it is somebody who is on time-limited venetoclax therapy, either for one year in the frontline setting or two years in the relapse setting, um, who is particularly high risk. So they might have those features that we mentioned earlier, like a TP53 mutation or a deletion 7TP mutation, and they're really worried about coming off. That's somebody that I might use the MRD testing. And if they're undetectable on the testing, then I would take them off. Um, but in general, when I go down that pathway of treating someone with venetoclax, I usually stick to the one year or two years. This is a hot topic, by the way. Not everyone shares that opinion. And I'm sure if you ask 10 different CLL doctors what they do in that scenario, we might all give slightly different answers. Um, but that's what, um, what I mean by partial response versus complete response versus undetectable minimal residual disease. So I guess it's fair to say that if someone is in remission from their CLL, it may not mean that their cancer is completely gone. It's Yes. And so as you noted, I did not say the word remission there at yeah. all. So I sometimes use the word remission when we, it depends on who I'm talking to and sort of what we're talking about. Um, remission can mean a lot of different things. Unfortunately, still with CLL, it's not considered a curable disease. We're hopeful that patients who hit that undetectable minimal residual disease level of detection are cured, but we really need to follow those patients uh, for a really long time. Um, and I do suspect that some of them might be cured, but I think that's still a rarity. And so I try not to use the word remission. I try to use those words I had said before, the partial complete response, detection of undetectable minimal residual disease to help guide my patients um, and inform them of how long I think that they'll be in a time where their disease is really well controlled. Thanks. So that's a wonderful, wonderful explanation. Thank you. Um, and now we have kind of a, an assortment of questions of different topics, some of which we've hit already, but um, some really interesting questions. One person wrote in asking about whether you know, you know, supplements like zinc or vitamin D are helpful for chronic yeah. leukemia. Dr. Thurman, would you be able to comment on that? Yes, uh, I'm not aware of any studies that have shown uh, a benefit to supplements. I think a lot of people uh, have this belief that there has to be some supplement that will help with their uh, leukemia. And unfortunately, I, I just haven't seen any, any positive results uh, along those lines. And I think sometimes people can get themselves into trouble. I've seen people take too much zinc and, and have some uh, effects on their blood counts uh, from that. Perfect. And so I, I, I suggest that instead of spending the money on the supplements, I would donate that money to the Leukemia Research Foundation and uh, allow for more research in the future because I think that would be much better. And I, I think the only thing that people get from these supplements typically is 
uh, our side effects. Yeah, uh, I appreciate that, that information. Um, another individual asked about the cost of CLL drugs, and I think we can all appreciate that the CLL drugs and frankly also the CML drugs can be cost prohibitive. Um, could either of you comment on any information about when these drugs might cost less or become generic or available by sources that are, aren't quite so costly? I can go ahead and chat about that. Um, it'll probably still be some time before even a brutinib becomes generic. Um, and that's because a government regulation on cancer therapeutics basically lengthened the time that they're required to go generic. Um, we recently talked about what year it will go generic, and it was much longer than I realized it would be. To be honest, I forgot what year that is. Someone could look it up. That'd be great, but I just don't know off the, head, the top of my head. Um, but what I will say is that um, there are a lot of medication assistance programs out there. Um, a lot of foundations offer this. Um, I believe the Leukemia Research Foundation also offers things like this. Um, as well as the um, drug companies themselves have a lot of programs available um, where they can get you free drug um, or drug that is um, significantly discounted. So there are a lot of things called vouchers, um, medication assistance programs, as I said, that you should look into for sure uh, before just accepting the bill that you get from after your insurance. Um, especially um, for lower wage earners, um, there are very much available options out there for patients to to, to get these drugs covered. So mm -hmm. make sure to exhaust all of your medication assistance program options before, before paying for any of these things. And do you think patients can be um, directed towards those from their oncologist's office? Yeah, so certain oncologist offices are more equipped to do this than others. I know at OSU, we have an entire group that's dedicated to doing medication assistance. I'm sure they have that at UChicago and Wisconsin as well. Um, and so this is another reason why getting a second opinion does matter. So for instance, um, I've had patients who have come to me from three hours away um, just because they can't afford the drug. And then we get the drug covered underneath our own programs. Um, and then typically what, if, if, if I can't transfer that program to the local doc, what I'll do is I'll be the prescribing uh, physician um, and I'll see that patient maybe every six months and let the local doc see them in between for blood draws. So maybe I wouldn't see them as often as I would someone who I'm taking primary care of. Um, but I do this a lot with some partnerships across, uh, across Ohio and other states uh, for patients um, as I'm, if, I, if I can get the drug cheaper um, here at OSU. So that's certainly an option as well. Thanks. Um, another question, someone wrote in and asked whether myeloproliferative neoplasms such as myelofibrosis are considered chronic leukemias? I guess you could consider them chronic leukemias. It's just that traditionally, the game has been but they oh, are very... Dr. Deininger, it's a little tough to hear you. I apologize. Okay, so uh, is it better now? Yeah. Okay, so I'm, I'm saying the... Some of these disorders have traditionally been given different names that don't sound like leukemia, but in essence, they are very similar. It's just that the manifestations they take are maybe not very high white counts, but more low white counts, more platelet counts than high white cell counts. But in principle, all these diseases are related to each other. They are coming out of the bone marrow where stem cells acquire mutations that essentially work like growth factors. They tell the cells to grow too fast and uh, over time, over time. Oh, thank you. That's very, that's helpful clarification. I know it's confusing terminology and that's very helpful. Um, I may turn a little bit to some of the questions in the Q&A box. Um, a few of these we've already addressed. Um, there was a question about MRD testing it for someone with CLL. Um, and then there was another question about um, side effects of abrutinib versus acalabrutinib. I think we touched on it a little bit. Um, I guess specifically, does acalabrutinib have some of the bleeding risks and other side effects that abrutinib has? Yeah, so there was a recent study called Elevate RR that compared abrutinib to acalabrutinib. 
And uh, what they found, um, and this was for patients with uh, high-risk disease, so they had to have either deletion 17P or something called deletion 11Q. Um, and the primary point of this um, trial was to determine if acalabrutinib was safer than abrutinib. Um, and it turned out it was. There was um, uh, less risk of basically all the side effects, um, hypertension, atrial fibrillation, and bleeding. Um, and so in general, this was a, in my opinion, practice changing trial, um, where unless I'm putting on, putting someone on a clinical trial where they'll receive abrutinib, I, I use acalabrutinib or zanabrutinib as standard of care. And I, and I think a lot of my colleagues do the same thing. And so it's a very rare situation that I will put somebody on abrutinib as standard of care. Maybe it's a cost thing, like we talked about earlier, where for some reason I can get abrutinib for a cheaper cost or something like that. Um, but unless they're going on a clinical trial, all things considered equal, because of Elevate RR and then the other study, which compared Xanabrutinib to Abrutinib, which is Alpine, which just came out, which also showed that Xanabrutinib was safer than Abrutinib in a different population of patients. In general, I'm no longer using Abrutinib in frontline patients. Got it. And this, the, the individual who, who wrote in is a singer, and they're specifically asking whether either of these medications could impact their ability to sing. Um, that not that I've heard. Um, and so typically we don't see things like uh, change in, um, so one of the things that we do see sometimes in clinical trials, which is a funny word, is dysgeusia, which means altered taste. So mm -hmm. when someone has like altered taste, I typically uh, would think that they have dry mouth or something like that. I, I, would, I haven't seen that any, anything like that with, um, with the BPK neighbors in general. Oh, wonderful, wonderful. Um, another question about whether a patient with CML should regularly wear a mask. For all practical purposes, you should just follow what a normal individual would do. There is no risk, uh, no, no evidence that risk is increased for CML patients. Um, unless you have active disease and you are in accelerated phase of last phase. Otherwise, just follow um, what you yeah, would do with that no CML. Got it. So for someone with CML whose disease is under control, um, and who's in chronic phase, probably no extra precautions necessary above what's currently being recommended. But for someone with accelerated or blast phase disease, obviously going through different types of therapies, that might be different. Um, Dr. Thierman, what's your recommendation for people with CLL and mask wearing? Well, so people with CLL are, are at risk for getting viral infections. I And I mentioned this before. So I, I, I do recommend that CLL patients uh, wear a mask whenever they're uh, exposed to other people uh, and to try to limit contact. I know it's uh, getting difficult uh, as people have wanted to put COVID behind them, but uh, I, I, do, I do think people with CLL have to be a little bit more cautious than, than others uh, still. And as I mentioned before, make sure you get the booster and uh, uh, if you do develop symptoms of COVID, get tested right away and uh, hopefully get treated with a drug like Paxlovid. If someone with CLL comes in contact with someone with COVID, but does not themselves yet, or I guess is not, not exposed, but kind of concerned about their risk of contracting COVID, is Evushield something that, is in the realm of options for someone with CLL? Well, that's a good question. Uh, last year, we were giving Evyshell to uh, a large number of our CLL patients, but unfortunately, it looks like the uh, activity of Evyshell against the newer Omicron variants is very low. And so this is something that happens with COVID as it evolves over time. It doesn't look like there's much benefit to using Evisheld anymore. So we've pretty much stopped doing that. I don't know what they're doing at, at other centers. Uh, but fortunately, Paxlovid still continues to work. So if someone is exposed, you know, they could just do a daily COVID test. And if it's negative, they're fine. And if it turns positive, then they could call their physician and try to go on Paxlovid, which still works against the Omicron variants. Wonderful. Um, Dr. Kate, it sounds like someone is very interested in your discussion of pure, pure, pure to I'm saying that all wrong. 
Do you have any thoughts about how long it may be before it's approved for CLL? That's a great question. Um, I don't know. Um, I hope soon, but I really have no clue. Um, so we're not counting on days? No, um, no. But I'm hopeful, hopeful maybe by the end of the year, but oh, I've said that before about other things I've been wrong, so <laughs> I try not to guess anymore. Understood. All right. Um, I think we're making it through the questions. Um, we had someone else write in who it sounds like is on a clinical trial, so they've been to an academic center and they're on a trial with a brutinib and venetoclax. And um, again, not to give specific advice, uh, medical advice, but if someone were to have blood blisters while they're on a brutinib in general, um, or any signs of bleeding, would you recommend they give their doc treating doctor a call and that that would be something that their doctor would wanna hear about? Yes, and on top of that, when you're on a clinical trial, so any clinical trial has a protocol that's associated with it. And um, basically the protocol is this very large document, very dense, about 100 to 150 pages sometimes, um, that outlines basically every expected scenario that could happen on the protocol. And so there's usually some very specific warning, especially regarding bleeding and abrutinib, um, outlined in the protocol that the treating provider has to follow. So um, if you're having any bleeding events while receiving a BTK inhibitor, whether it be abrutinib, acalabrutinib, and xanabrutinib, definitely get in touch with your treating doctor. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, Carrie, I think we're coming near to the end of the session. Yes. Thank you very much. So I, um, as we wrap up here, I just wanted to thank all of you, Dr. Kate, Dr. Thurman, Dr. Deininger, for, um, for being panelists and for letting us grill you with questions, as well as giving up part of your Sunday for um, patients and caregivers. And Dr. Carlson, you did a fabulous job as our moderator. So thank you so much for that as well. Um, just a reminder about the evaluation I'll be sending right after this. And also there were a few questions I was trying to write in the chat. I hope many of you saw that um, we will be sending a transcript as well as the recording. So if there is a certain like drug name or something that you missed that you were trying to take notes, you will be able to um, see that later. We'll do that to the best of our ability. Um, and then also I wanted to mention that um, we will be having our acute leukemia Q&A on March 5th. So um, certainly if you know of any patients or family members or caregivers who would benefit from that program, um, you can have them register. And last but not least, there were a few different um, website resources and other financial assistance type resources mentioned today. I will try to link those um, along with the transcript as well when we send it out so that you can access those resources that were talked about today. So thank you again to mm -hmm. all of our fabulous expert physicians for um, giving of their time. We greatly appreciate it and um, have a great rest of your Sunday, everyone. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you very thank much. You. Take care. It's good to see you. Thank you.